Space is for everybody. It's not just for a select group of astronauts. That's our new frontier, out there. It was freezing cold on launch pad 39B. As night gave way to morning, a dull and wintry sunrise slowly spread warmthless daylight over Cape Canaveral and the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Forty-five massive flood lamps lighting the steel launch tower with blinding clarity were switched off, and a gleaming space shuttle stood poised for its next mission. The space shuttle, or orbiter, was named Challenger, and like three other winged spacecraft in the fleet, it was named for a famous ship of exploration. This was to be Challenger's tenth flight into space on a mission carrying seven astronauts, five men and two women. There had been several delays to the flight, the latest just a day earlier. Despite the extreme chill, the Cape forecast was for clear skies. Optimism and expectation ran high. The date was Tuesday, 28 January 1986. At 7 o'clock that morning, the temperature stood at minus 5 degrees Celsius, 23 degrees Fahrenheit. NASA's ICE team had just returned from their latest inspection of the shuttle's huge external fuel tank. The tank had been refueled with supercooled propellants, causing ice to crust on its exterior. It was the team's job to check the amount of ice at the launch pad in case it reached dangerous levels. Their report was alarming. Sheets of ice and even thick stalactites had formed on many of the launch pad facilities. Given the massive vibration associated with liftoff, this ice could be dislodged and tumble down onto the ascending spacecraft. The team managed to break off and remove many of the thicker sections of ice, but it soon built up once again in the chill, moist air. The situation was far from ideal. When she was woken at 6.20 that morning, Krista McAuliffe's first thought was to peer excitedly through her window at the distant launch pad. She never grew tired of the sight before her. Brilliantly illuminated by flood lamps, Challenger pointed at the early dawn sky, mounted on its massive rust-colored external tank, which in turn was flanked by two gleaming white solid rocket boosters. The external tank would feed liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen through two fuel lines into the orbiter. There they would mix and ignite, powering the spacecraft's rear-mounted main engines. Adding further massive thrust to the launch, the two booster rockets carried more than a million kilograms of solid fuel propellant. When the countdown reached zero, the boosters would ignite and keep firing until the fuel was spent. They were very similar in principle to the sky rockets Krista and her friends had sent aloft in their childhood. Dressed casually, the crew met in the dining area for NASA's traditional pre-launch breakfast. In the center of their table sat a huge cake, decorated with a design of Challenger and the names of the crew. After they'd enjoyed breakfast together, the astronauts took an elevator back up to their rooms, where they would partially suit up for the flight. Following this, they reassembled in the crew quarters, here they received their final weather briefing and were told about the critically low temperature and ice at the launch pad. Despite this, it was a glorious day, with weak winds and increasingly blue skies. Outside, in the freezing weather, invited guests sat and shivered in their special viewing area located a safe distance from the pad. Relatives of the crew, reporters and cameramen, Special guests and a large group of schoolchildren sat huddled against the cold, hoping that this would be the day Challenger and its crew finally rocketed skyward and slid into orbit. The flight had already been delayed several times due to malfunctions and bad weather. Just a day earlier, the countdown had reached T minus nine minutes before a faulty bolt in the external hatch handle jammed, putting the launch on hold.